Cheese. Welcome to the Talk of Fame podcast. It's crazy to me that, you know, 2023 is almost over, which is insane. I feel like it was just January 1st, two days ago, which is absolutely insane. How, like how 2023 flew by, but this, um, like with the this entire year, it really brought so many things for the podcast. As you could probably tell if you've been a listener for a while, but um, with this today's guest, she has been doing so many amazing things. Mm-hmm. But um, as you might wonder who today's guest is, we have Janice Taylor, who is born and raised by a single mom with loving support from families all over the world in Saskatchewan. Is that how you say it, Janice? Saskatchewan. It was Saskatchewan. Ooh, it sounds like is it, it sounds like yes. a French or like Greece or something type of name. It's, uh, it's actually, I believe, um, an indigenous word, Saskatchewan. Ooh, really? Uh, like that's, yeah. I never even heard of that name. Like that's, I yeah. sound like something like. So it's a province in the middle of Canada, essentially. Like if they, you looked at North Dakota and looked north, you you'd hit Saskatchewan, basically. Ooh. Mm-hmm. I'll have to check that out once we head off of this one. Yeah. But you yeah, emerged from tough circumstances growing up in additions, communities, and half towns and the streets. These circumstances laid a foundation to the development of a 30 year study asking one question Can we really heal? Which is a great question, which I literally just started asking myself last week. That's FYI. Okay. But her journey took her from the pharmaceutical industry, sitting in jugs of a difficult and indivisible, indivisible drug of the tech industry where she spent the last 15 years all this led her to build her own theory of how people heal with an special thesis that early trauma before a 10th birthday which impacts 99 percent of the world and shows up in all places of our life from mm-hmm. addition from addictions to relationships to mental health and also pain will doubtly manifest through all aspects of our lives she also created and launched fundraise for different step startups, and she launched AHHA Healing. She started her tech career at the Oprah Winfrey Show, and finally is the author of the Wisdom Souls and Startup. I know that is seriously a long intro, Janice, but yeah. I'm super excited to chat with you on the podcast. I really appreciate you today. To- well, thank you for having me. This is so awesome. Thank you so much. And I know this is like the same, like just like, okay, well, why is she asking about the beginning of the career of the beginning of the podcast? But in case people are wondering, like when you start out, like especially with the Oprah Winfrey show, with how big and popular it was and still is to today, like once you hear they're like, oh my gosh, how did she land that like a job at Oprah Winfrey show with the like how with how big Oprah is? But like, how did you you know lay on the start your tech career at the Oprah Winfrey show? You know, it's interesting because you're probably again of a generation that has only ever had technology, right? You yeah. probably knew it got an iPhone had you know had connections was grew up in technology but I was of the generation before technology but then I saw when people started to get cell phones and then we started to get Facebook and social media I started to notice that people were starting to change and I was like wow people aren't in the park as much they're not getting out of the car like and my kids were really little at the time and I thought well no one's really talking to each other And I thought it was bizarre because we never saw people looking down on our phones. Like that was not something we grew up with. Like people walked, they were outside and you knew everyone in the neighborhood I grew up in. So when I saw that, I was really concerned. And so I went home with this feeling of like my girls were five and two at the time. It's 2009. And I was like, this is going to be a problem. And so I Googled how to make a tech company. And I didn't know how to make a tech company, but I felt like I had to make a tech company. If I was going to solve something and protect my kids online, I thought I should have a tech company. I should understand how it's made. And I wanted to know the construction of it. And then lo and behold, uh, right after I did that, I just wrote Oprah and said, like, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And I'm going to quit my job. And I'm going to go into the tech industry so I can understand it. And uh, three days later, I had a call from the Oprah show. Two weeks later, I was on a plane to Chicago. And that's basically how I launched my foray into technology was at Oprah. Ooh, that's actually so great. Like, 
like it's like especially with being 2009 I like seriously remember I was only about three at the time but I remember like around that age around that you know when technology started like Mm -hmm. I just remember and like phones really wasn't really part of my childhood even though it was starting I was like I was still on my phone but not as much like as I do today, especially being on social media and doing podcasting and releasing these, these videos and audios to the world, I kind of have to be on social media, right? But it's like we starting a tech company in 2009 when that like social media and even phones were starting to kind of you know build. Like that's when really iPhones and all upgrades yes. come out about every year or every other year, like. It really, that's when it really started. And like, especially having your kids so young, like, yeah. um, like it's, you know, like great to really build yourself, even with having your kids so young. Because like, yeah. I, like with me, like, I didn't really have social media growing up. Of course, you know, I For did. Sure. Media, but it's like. But then you eventually yeah, sort of got the cell phone and, you know, in 2012, I moved to Silicon Valley. So I literally packed up my life and I moved to Silicon Valley and I was like, well, now I want to know and be in the Valley in California, how they're making tech companies. And I was going, because I was from Canada, they, you know, I was picked out of Canada to get sort of an inside look is like the future of technology from, from my perspective from, and they actually picked quite a few women. So I was in like Facebook campus and Apple campus and, h and campus and uh, we didn't go to Snapchat because I was in Venice but we went to all the major platforms like Google campus and all I could think about the entire time was like this is gonna go sideways like 2012 was kind of when everybody started to move onto a mobile and they were actually I was at Facebook and they were like well how do we take our desktop laptop and put it onto the phone And they were so excited um, as a group, like, oh, every kid's going to be able to have a computer in their pocket. And I was like, oh, my God, no, like, no, because as a mom, I was concerned about it. But with a background in psychology, I knew that this would be like an invisible drug, like eventually you'd go on it a little bit and then you'd be on it a bit more and then you'd want to have it all the time. And Mm -hmm. like the way that they had built it, they had built it to hook you into it. Mm -hmm. Like it's built in its construction that way. And that was disturbing to me. So I went there and basically was like a little bit of rage against the machine of like, this is going to be bad. (laughs) Like this is going to be bad for kids. Um, no one believed me, of course, but it was. Yeah, it's great that you realized that early on, because of course, you know, like like social media grows every single day. You know, it really grows every single day on people because, of course, you know, as a seventeen year old um teenager yeah. and a junior in high school, that like with being a junior in high school, they like, phones are the only thing we could do to communicate with each other outside of school. And yeah. sometimes I see a little bit more that schools are, like most of the cases in, in-person schools are on their phones, you know? Right. Especially in our local districts. I'm like, think of myself like, are you supposed to be learning? Well, yeah, school? like even your teachers, if they're being honest, like how many teachers are on the side, scroll, 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 right? Like, you know, they're not supposed to be on their phones either, but I'm I'm going to bet there's a lot of teachers that are like under the desk during exam time on their phones too, even though they're telling kids not to be on their phone. So kind of like, it's not just kids that it bit, it kind of bit everybody and took everybody away in a storm. And if you look at what's happening on TikTok, for example, now, right, it's, it changes the way you see the world mm-hmm. and it's, and it's actually in its design, like, what, what shocked me moving to Silicon Valley was knowing this, I have a psychology background. So knowing what social experiments and psychological experiments can be done on humans in back in the day, and then seeing this combined with new technologies was, it, it still is very disturbing to me because it actually changes how you see the world and how you respond emotionally to the point that you don't even know you're on it. It's like, Mm -hmm. that's what's so kind of insidious about the, why I call it the invisible drug 
is because most people don't even know they're high and they are technically in their being having a fogged perception of what they're seeing or what they're reading. Like you could read, yeah, whatever. And it could be, yeah, whatever. Or it could be, yeah, whatever. Right. So depending on how you read the exact same thing, yeah, whatever could be the most innocuous statement, but depending on how you're feeling, it could be like, oh my God, can you believe they said, yeah, whatever. Or they said, yeah, whatever, like excited. But depending on where you are in the world, you will take it in two different ways. And that's what makes it dangerous is because it, it hooks you into a story that may or may not be true. Mm -hmm. That's like as someone that does all those emotions every single day, I totally get that because as a person with, you know, like doing all these things and responding to emails or messages from friends, sometimes I'm like, okay, I like that's the happiest personality. And I'm like, why did they say that? Like, are you serious? Like, come on. But it's like with social media, like to bring you back to TikTok, like TikTok did well. TikTok was the thing before the pandemic. I was on it. Like, it was musically before it was TikTok. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. It was like I think it was like I think it's transitioned like 2018 or 19. I think around that time. But like when like it wasn't really popular for say. Like it was popular, but now like the biggest app on the world. Oh, for it, sure. it was until the pandemic that like it really skyrocketed everyone was on it 24 7 including me I'm not afraid to say that I was one of those people yeah, yeah. of course with the pandemic all you can do is be on social media talk to your family on social media whether it's like through zoom like we're doing right now or facetime because I know that not everyone has to um FaceTime if they have like a Samsung or something and not everyone likes a FaceTime, especially in today's world. It you really guys still basically text through Snap, right? Do you guys yeah. most text? So you text through Snap and you take in content on TikTok. Now I think initially with TikTok when, with musically, which musically at the time was terrifying because so many little girls were getting mm-hmm. musically and it was terrifying that they were and it was harmless enough when it was like oh I'm just gonna link lip sync to music videos and music right it was like here I'm gonna dance and it's a musical and this is Mm -hmm. basically karaoke on a phone but then it turned into where people get their news and then it turned into a proliferation of everything and humans in their psychology don't do well when they're in a big giant basket of everything of chaos, like humans can't possibly sift through all that information and then try to figure out who they really are and how to then even feel good. Like, it's just like, for lack of a better term, you're thrown into a pile of manure Mm -hmm. and and then said, can't you smell the roses? Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, because I'm in the bottom of turd pile. And no, I can't smell the roses. And then people say, well, can't you smell the roses? Why can't you smell the roses? And it's like, well, you sit at the bottom of this manure pile. And then tell me if you smell roses. Yeah. And in, in like, it, like also with TikTok and like social media, it really, you know, makes a lot of teenagers my age and maybe a little, um, a couple years younger, also self-confident about how they look and how they act based mm-hmm. off of what they watch on TikTok, whether they're influencers or just people their age, maybe this is normal human being as they are, they can really feel like so confident be self of, oh, this person's prettier than me. Why can't I have their looks? Why can't I have their hair color? Like, it really also makes yeah. people self-confident about how, who they are and how they look. Of course, it it's built. So the way that it's built, it's built like in its construction, digitally behind the scenes, it, it's built into fear. And so it operates in a place of you feeling afraid so that you will stay and scroll more to find a solution in that space. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, I have to, if I just keep staying here, I'm going to find something funny or it's something that's going to lift me up or something, but it's not wired that way. So how it's actually wired in the psychology and all social media, not just TikTok, it's wired to make you feel bad about yourself. Exactly. But then it's also then wired for you to rely on it for the answer to feel better about yourself. And so mm-hmm. it does two things. It makes you feel like crap. And then it makes you convinced that the solution is still there for you to not feel like crap. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's counterproductive. And that's why I said it's a big pile of manure 
because the rows in there is very difficult to pluck out because for every one positive nugget, there's about 20 things that are telling you that you're not good enough. Like it's telling you, oh, look at me, look at me, look at me. It's telling you like, oh, I've got this life that by this picture or this video that this is all worked out. When in reality, all of it is false. It's mm. probably everyone struggling on some level with who they are. And because we're human beings, and this goes back to the thesis that 99.9% .9 of the world has an emotional pain point before your 10th birthday. So mm -hmm. even if you had the most incredible parents and a great life, you still, everyone sort of has something. And I call it just the thorn before your 10th birthday. That thorn, you can think of it like a sliver that kind of stays in you. And if, you, if you've ever seen a sliver and you don't take it out, it can get red and then mm -hmm. it can get like... Ugh, like I can't get it and then you got to like kind of cut it to kind of get this sliver out mm -hmm. you kind of think about emotional pain everyone has a pain point before their 10th birthday everyone mm, everyone and, does that I actually experienced one of those actually to be quite honest with you like yeah. emotional pain whether it's like loss of a loved yeah. one or this person yes. on social media like there's so many ways yes. to deal with emotional pain yes yes exactly honey and like everyone has one mm -hmm. the difference is is that most people think that their head can solve that emotional pain mm. and the reality is is that your head can't it actually is more of an emotional spiritual to heal not necessarily a mental logic construct but emotional pain if you think about it like a sliver that stays in the body can become an abscess it can become like a big giant sore and then you go into social media or you go into these other places and people just pick up that sore or mm -hmm. they put salt on that sore. And the person on the other side doesn't know you have this sore, um, but you have it. And so what happens is then it starts to take over your thoughts mm -hmm. and then your thoughts become things. And then those things become truth. And then you're in the spiral of that. Mm -hmm. When really you have to kind of go back to where the thorn is and you got to pluck it out mm -hmm. and if yeah. you pluck out the thorn, then the root can lie back down and then you won't be susceptible to the addiction of social media or bad relationships or people being mean to you or self-sabotaging in any way. But right now, especially your generation, like you guys are in the wild. Like I, mm -hmm. I, whew, I feel extraordinarily empathic for any teenager today because holy crap, you guys are in the wild. Like 100%. I, I'm literally 17 years are, old. I say that all the time. I'm you guys are in the wild, aren't you? Don't yeah, you? Yeah, we like, are. I'm being so, like I'm, like, I'm being so serious. We are in that. Like, you are. And I feel so like, I just want to take every teenager that I meet and hug them. And like yank them out of there for a minute because it's like, it's got to be hard on your soul. Do you find it hard on your soul? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Like as a person that grew up with anxiety mm. and seeing other people like living their best lives and, you know, judging other people, I'm just like, what am I doing with my life? This is why I think about mine a million times each day. But then look at you, you have a podcast, you're like going for it, you're doing all these things, but it's, it's got to be so hard because you guys are in the wild. Like my generation, probably your mom's age or dad's age, like we grew up at a time before technology mm -hmm. and then after. So we actually know what it's like to just be on our, in our own sh shit, for lack of a better term, yeah. like to just be on our own, like go take care of your stuff. Like we kind of were raised as Gen Xers to be that way. Mm -hmm. You guys are on, like on, as you start your day, you're in it, you're in the wild. You've got the mean stuff. Like I would never have been able to navigate the mean stuff. Like I will, my daughter's your age and I will read what something happens. And I'm like, <gasps> like that can't be said to someone. Like mm -hmm. that can't be said to someone. And you're on the other side of the screen. And I'm like, oh my God. Like, mm. you guys are in the wild. 
Oh, we definitely are. And I even see like like a bunch of kids younger than me act so I can't find a word for it. It's like it's like they act so different from when I was their age. Which yeah, is absolutely so you're great. even seeing a difference from your age to another generation. So mm-hmm. imagine now like how much further away you get from what makes you special as a human being. And this is what I've studied 30 years is that I have met with famous people. I've worked with athletes. I've worked with movie stars. I've worked with musicians um, all on their healing journey. I've worked with people that are in drug addiction and recovery. I've worked with the wealthiest to the poorest and everything in between. And Mm -hmm. this is what I know to be true. Every single person has a pain point that they need to solve within Mm -hmm. themselves. And the pain point also is every single person has a calling, has a mission that they're, that they are specifically designed to. So my entire life's work is to every person I meet for them to know that they have a calling, that they have a mission bigger than their imagination. That's my whole jam that, you know, that they don't just stay in pain, that they transform their pain into their purpose, that they can use what happened to them into something that is magnificent. And I think everyone has it, including you. So it's like literally every single person I meet, I'm like, well, that's remarkable. And, and it's always true. I haven't met a person yet in all the years I've been doing this work that doesn't have a calling. Every single one has a calling. I've met a woman that's lost her children, who's been a heroin addict, who's trying to figure it out, who's just come out of jail. I've met women and men that are making hundreds of millions of dollars and they still don't feel like they have their calling. I've met famous people that do the work that they do and still don't feel like they matter. And so it's really across the board. Every single person has a calling. They all do. Yeah. Like even if it's famous people, like I know with being so famous and with social media, it really also real makes people think like, oh, they're celebrities, they don't have feelings. Like they think they have everything with a bunch of money, living in a mansion, like buying everything they want. But sometimes I'm like, I like wonder, I'm like, do celebrities like, like, I would like, 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 I be like, sometimes, like, I just get into that mindset, like, oh, they don't feel those feelings. But at the same time, I'm like, well, even though they have fame, like, people know who they are. I can but tell you, the in, so inside cool. of that, it does not. I've been inside that world and as an observer, and I can tell you that they have the exact same insecurities that anybody else does. They have the same doubts about whether they're loved as anybody else does. Lots of them are crippled with anxiety and mental health issues. Many of them, you know, do drugs. Many of them try to figure out their way. Like they're almost the same. The only difference between them and somebody else is that people know them because of social media more than say someone else who doesn't necessarily have the following It's the only difference in -hmm. some cases, because people don't see them as human beings anymore, because once you reach a certain level of fame, people just don't see your humanity. They Mm -hmm. don't think you have this because you have money or you have beauty or you have the right boyfriend or the right house or the right job or the famous movie that just came out. But in every case, because I've been doing this work for so long, they all struggle with the same. Mm -hmm. Some people are so mean to themselves that even when they are at the pinnacle of their career they still don't believe they deserve it and so even in those cases and then we give people a device and then we uh, this the way that they're built they allow cruelty cruelty is accepted in social media cruelty is an afterthought we we legitimately don't think that it's a problem And yet cruelty in social media has caused the death of many kids. Oh, 100%. 100%. Like it would, if I were in charge, having been in the tech industry for this long, I would have a zero tolerance for cruelty. Um, But because they care about money, most of these platforms and people being there and staying there, they allow cruelty. If I was your generation, 
I would be protesting that more than I would be protesting anything else. I would want safe places to interact online. I would want no cruelty, like kicked off the bus cruelty. If you are mean to someone else, you are like, you're walking. Like I would lock it down and be like, you don't get your privileges. Cause it's a privilege to be able to interact in the ways that you do. Mm-hmm. But there, you guys, their cruelty is, is allowed. And there's lots of psychological studies around when people are cruel in groups, what happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people don't actually want to be cruel at times, but they can't help but be cruel. Mm-hmm. So I, you guys are in the wild. I'm full empathy for you and your generation. <laughs> for sure. Thank you. Like, honestly, it's honestly so painful at times. Even though I love social media and what it has to offer with meeting a variety mm-hmm. of different people and connecting with people I know. Mm-hmm. But it's also like, what am I seeing at the same exact time? I'm like, okay, like it's hard. And do you find out, yourself, yeah. like, are you a sensitive person by nature? Some points, yes. I yeah. can I'm, sometimes can be very sensitive, but at the same time, I'm just, I just walk it off and be like, okay, this is a video that I saw, and I am not going to recover. But, you know, it honestly depends on what I'm seeing and how I react to it. Like, sometimes I'm like, okay, like, this is video, this is normal. Like, I'm just going to, you know, this re- move you on. you bravely put yourself out in a podcast all the time. Yeah. Like, you bravely do this beautifully which I'm again not to be facetious because you're a professional in this case but I'm really proud of you like that's that's really hard to do that's hard to put yourself out in the world um to do that so well done well done like honestly I'm gonna be completely honest with you like I never say this but it's honestly like very you know difficult at times to release some episodes of the podcast so I can be totally I'm totally honest with you like even having a podcast I'm 17 years old I love it I love it so much like it's something I never knew I was doing at 17 years old nor at 14 when I started at 14 but it's like it, with social media it can be very difficult in having a podcast at a young age it to be like it's very can be very difficult at 14 to 7 years 17 years old even though I've been doing this for so long and mm. I'm still learning yeah, it definitely can come with its pros and cons. One, I can imagine. What made you decide to do a podcast? Yeah, so basically, um, if people never know, um, basically I'm from northeastern Pennsylvania, and so basically, I grew up with two cousins that work for a local news station here in Pennsylvania, and basically, um, I you know I always grew up watching them on the news, um. And my it was in my aunt. I always been very close. I always watch on TV, and my we were at family gatherings. They would talk about all oh, the stories they covered. And mm-hmm. when I'm scrolling on social media, believe it or not, um, I would see all their posts and what they're up to with their work and um, like everything in the news, like the vision has to offer. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool that they're doing that. And I was like, what? And sometimes I'm like, maybe I can be a journalist. But of course, with being a shy girl growing up from a small town, I felt like it was impossible. Like I thought it was, you know, very impossible for a shy girl to be a journalist yeah. or even a podcast. So it literally, you know, wasn't a thing for what I was seeing, but once the pandemic hit I was like I'm bored out of my mind I'm tired of watching tv and being on social media all the time like I was trying to figure out through that period what to do to keep myself busy during that time of the COVID and we were like really to leave the house so I was like I need to do something with my life like I'm tired of not doing anything and so basically but in 2021, I was like, okay, like, I, I know where I was, what, I should start a podcast, like, if I, maybe for a couple of weeks until the pandemic's over, and then once the pandemic's over, you can go on and live your life, you know, do something, like, do, like, like live back your life, like, before COVID, and I was like, okay, well, I started for a couple of episodes, it won't last long, because I'm the kind of person that loves to quit things so easily so I was like okay well I'll start this 
and we watch their, you know, TV um like segments and everything and learn from in terms of what they do and also watch other, you know, journalists as well. But um and yeah, so basically it started in 2021. Um and now uh, two years later, you know, it's still going strong, which is very surprising. That's great. But, Are your parents super proud of you? Like this is amazing. Yeah, they are super proud. All right. Well, I hope they are. Um, I hope they are. But, this is you know. amazing. Like, it takes an extraordinary um, human to decide that, hey, I'm going to do this, then to follow through and to then execute and put it into the world at your age over the last two years to sustain it. Plus to take, I'm sure not everybody's nice to you when you put out an episode, oh, right? Please. Like, because it's social media and people are cruel, but at the same time for you to have the fortitude to do it. And so if you take nothing else from this call, you should be extraordinarily proud of yourself. Like you. this is very rare. I meet a lot of people who do a lot of things. This is very rare at your age to do this and to see it through. So like, if nothing else, you should know that what you're doing is magnificent. That's really terrific. No, and, you. and you don't know where it's going to take you, right? So you could be from here to doing something else to doing something else. Like it's, it's, it's all a journey. So enjoy it. Soak it up, like be proud of yourself. And I'm sure it's hard, mm -hmm. you know, because it's hard putting yourself on your own out into the world. And mm -hmm. You know, not everybody receives things in a graceful way. Not everybody sees your path or your vision that you have for yourself. And that's the hard part when you start to strive for your, your dreams and your goals and your calling is that a lot of people won't get it and they don't need to get it. You need to get it. You need to be like, I'm doing this and damn the cost. Like, mm -hmm. I don't care what anybody thinks. And it's hard because people always are addicted to telling people what they think, but Oh, what was that? Like I did, like I literally can't awesome. tell you how many people have did had done that in the last two years of doing this. It's happened more than you could possibly say. To be quite yeah. honest. Well, I think you're remarkable, and thank I'm. You. Thank you for having me on. This has been so cool. Of course, thank you so much yeah. for coming on. Um, we yes, definitely have to do a part two to talk about more things. But I really appreciate you coming on and taking the time. And thank you, everyone. For listening, I hope you guys learned a lot from this episode. I definitely sure did. I love filming this. This is definitely, I'm not saying that we're filming it, but it's definitely one of my favorite episodes I've filmed so far. So I really appreciate you coming on and seeing okay. it. Okay, but let's, and let's keep in touch and, you know, let's see how you do on your world and we'll see how I do over in my world. And I'm sure there'll be a time for us to collaborate again. So congratulations yeah. on this podcast. It's awesome. Thank awesome. you so much. I appreciate that. If you ever okay. need help with anything at all, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Bye. so much. Okay. Good Bye. luck. Bye. Okay. Bye.